We are going to be, just so you know, we're going to be, if you have the book, we're going to be in the chapter that begins with the title, Keep in Step with Jesus by Living More Simply. And as, as we begin, I want to recommend a couple books. Uh, because uh, in this chapter, I mentioned both these writers, and it happens in this instance that they're friends of mine. I work with them. So if you, want, if you find this of interest, just come up when we're done, and you can take a look at the book. One is by Rochella Parm, or Parham, Parm. And it's called Mythical Me, Finding Freedom from Constant Comparison. And it's got a self button on the front. <laughs> it's published by InterVarsity. Uh, and I'll be mentioning uh, Rachilla's uh, particular struggle when it comes to a discipline like the discipline of simplicity. And I mentioned her in the chapter. And the second book is by Juanita Rasmus, who also works with Renovare, and it's called Learning to Be Finding Your Center After the Bottom Falls Out. <laughs> and, and Juanita had a nervous breakdown. She had a nervous breakdown. I think she was flat on her back in bed for six months. But the reason, and the, why I'm, I'm mentioning this at the beginning of our time together, the reason she is convinced is she was looking at her ministry and herself in a way that simply was not helpful. The way she was looking at herself burned her out, burned her out. So this is, both of these books, I'm telling you, they're really good books, really, book, really good books. Both are really good writers, and uh, both, are, both of these women are filled with wisdom. So you might want to come up and uh, take a look. So I'm on page uh, 222, if you have the book. If you don't have the book, just lis listen carefully. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, this is the first time I think I've done this, I'm gonna read the first three uh, quotes that I used at the beginning of chapters because they're, they're quite important. And I'll, I'll emphasize um, some things as we go on. First is from Henry Nowen. Many of you have read Henry. Quote, many of my daily preoccupations suggest that I belong more to the world than to God. A little criticism makes me angry, and a little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits, and a little success excites me. Often I am like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. Henry battled with this all his life. His sense of well-being, his sense of success, and his, his sense of failure based on what people were saying and how they were responding to him. And he sensed in uh, to the day of his death, he sensed there was a freedom that Christ was offering himself from other people and what other people were thinking of him. Now, this is Juanita from the book, book I just mentioned. I'm also learning the new freedom that comes. Even while my stomach churns in rebellion, as I abandon my old script of asking, what will people think? They will think whatever they think. And I will go on and so will they. I have come to realize that I'm just not all that important. That my absence will not cause the great chaos that my ego had convinced me of. Now, Juanita is a very, very impressive woman. She is the pastor with her husband of a very large church in Houston. 
large uh, Methodist church, I believe it is. And hundreds and hundreds of people come to that church every week. And she has found freedom to minister there in a different way as she realized, <laughs> let me read it again. I have come to realize I'm just not all that important and that my absence will not cause the great chaos that my ego had convinced me of. So in some ways, uh, learning to live more simply has to do with one's ego. Now here's Richard. Richard's going to comment now on some of uh, the practices of simplicity, but, but the practices don't come. And I'm, I won't mention them uh, yet. The practices don't come until we get the heart of the discipline right. And then we'll, we'll ask questions about money and cars and watches and who knows what. He says this, we are made to feel ashamed to wear clothes or drive cars until they're worn out. The mass media have convinced us that to be out of step with fashion is to be out of step with reality. <sighs> it's time we awaken to the fact, memorize this line if you have the book. It is time we awaken to the fact that conformity to a sick society is to be sick. Conformity to a sick society is to be sick. I like that. Food for thought. Food for thought. Now, I asked three questions on page 233 at the top of the page that I want, I want you to think about with me this morning. Now, you, these are questions that take five years contemplation, but at least we can get started. So don't panic if, you, if you're thinking about trying to answer them in, in the next uh, two minutes. It ain't going to happen. But let me read them to you. What's the fundamental orientation of my life? What's the fundamental orientation of my life? To whom, and next question, to whom and to what do I give my ultimate allegiance? Next one. What does my concrete behavior over the past month indicate about what I value most deeply? So simplicity has to do with orientation. It has to do with allegiance. And finally, it has to do with concrete behaviors based on fundamental values. The text that I want you to chew on for the next few months is in Matthew 6.33. And I've uh, listed this text for you, for those of you who don't have the book in front of you. Matthew 6.33 reads, uh, Seek first the kingdom of God. Orientation, seek first the kingdom of God. Allegiance, seek first the kingdom of God. Other translations, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Another translation, steep, your, this is uh, Eugene Peterson, steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find your, all your everyday human concerns will be met. So that's what we want to ponder this morning. Uh, learning how to seek first the kingdom. That is what simplicity is about. That's what learning to live a simple life is about. Seeking first the kingdom. Now the problem, the problem for all of us, the problem is it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that because we tend to be duplicitous or duplicitous. Uh, we struggle with duplicity. 
Uh, duplicity marks somebody, and it marks all of us to a certain extent. Uh, duplicity marks the person's life who's trying to live in two worlds simultaneously. Trying to live in two worlds simultaneously. Trying to seek first the kingdom of God, striving for the kingdom of God, as Jesus asked us to do, indeed commands us to do. So I got one, I got one foot, foot in the kingdom of God. Uh, I don't know, though. I got to hedge my bets. Hedge my bets a little bit. And I have my other foot in the kingdom of this world. And what happens is, that's a very unstable situation. Imagine uh, that you're on the sea, like Henry was thinking about. Well, I got one foot in this sailboat that's sailing in the direction of the kingdom of God, but I got my other foot in this boat and it's heading in the opposite direction. Direction. Sooner or later, I'm going to get dunked. So what I... Uh, think, of, think of words such as this. I'll read this to you, top of page 224. Failure to seek first the kingdom of God leads to lives marked by underlying anxiety. How anxious are you feeling today? Confusion, disappointment, and despair. We lose our orientation. Seeking first the kingdom of God is a, ma a matter of orientation and allegiance. We, we likely respond to the siren call of values opposed to those of Jesus' kingdom. Our hearts are divided. That's what duplicity is. It's a divided heart. A divided heart. Uh, I've mentioned Philip's translation of Romans 12, 1 and 2 a number of times in here. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. And when we, when we struggle with duplicity, we're getting, we sense we're being squeezed into a foreign mold while simultaneously, <laughs> simultaneously God's trying to squeeze us into a different mold. You can get a headache or a body ache or an emotional ache or a spiritual ache in that state. I looked up, uh, I took the Cambridge uh, Dictionary and looked up duplicity. And uh, I found a number of interesting words. Du duplicity. Simplicity? Yay. Duplicity? No. And I looked up duplicity. And this is what I, I ran across. A crock of. <laughs> artifice. Bad faith. Be a pack of lies. Canard, feed somebody a line, fib, fiction, flim flam, forked tongue, lie, mythologize, perjure, polygraph. That's an interesting word. What if the Lord gave you a polygraph test? Stretch the truth, white lie, whopper, all in the Cambridge Dictionary under the word duplicity. Now on 225, what characterizes duplicitous people? They speak out both sides of the, their mouths. They're like chameleons whose skin color changes according to their environment. Now think of, think of it. I use that metaphor of a chameleon, chameleon more than once in this chapter. A chameleon is trying to preserve its life. It's a lizard and it doesn't want to get eaten. And so when it senses its environment is threatening it, it changes color. It constantly responds to its environment and tries to disguise itself in its environment by changing its skin color. Duplicitous people, I'm arguing, are like chameleons whose skin color changes according to their environment. 
If they're with holy people, they act more holy than they really are. If they're with profane people, they act more profane than they really are. Duplicitous people are fundamentally divided. They're double-minded. See, what we want to do with something like simplicity is we want to take two minds and move them into one mind that is centered on the kingdom of God and seeking the values of Jesus' kingdom and living them out faithfully, uh, gracefully through the power of the Holy Spirit. Duplicitous people haven't decided whose side they're on. They might think they have, but this. Imagine a line in the sand, like I was just doing with water. On one side of the land stands Christ and his kingdom. On the other stand, side stands the kingdom of this world, ruled by a different king. This is Christ the King Sunday, yeah? yeah? We celebrate Christ the King. The danger is this present evil age is ruled by a different king. That's where the issue of allegiance comes in. At certain times and certain contexts and with certain people, they gladly pledge their loyalty to the kingdom of God and verbally express their allegiance to Jesus. At other times, they cross over into the kingdom of this world, back and forth, back and forth. They're fundamentally divided in their loyalties. The result, divided, divided loyalties tire one out. It's exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting to live in two worlds so different from one another. And when we live divided lives before a watching world, we surely give faith a bad name. Now, when I was a, when I was a, a young guy, uh, <laughs> immature, 19, 20, 21, I was mad about everything. And I, I was especially mad about Christians because I, because I was longing for God. I can't tell you how I was longing for God. I said, your life is at stake here. Your life's at stake. And yet, I was, uh, I admit it, terribly judgmental. Terribly judgmental. But here was my problem. I was looking at people who had this wonderful, <laughs> this wonderful message. Oh, it's so wonderful. Death has been conquered. We can be forgiven our sins. It's just a wondrous message. And I thought to myself, why are you living so much like me? Why are you living so much like me? And it was very troubling to me. Because I thought somebody, somebody who's encountered Jesus, as I'm understanding who Jesus is, would surely be living differently. Now, I'm sure you're all feeling guilty. <laughs> don't. 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 We all struggle with duplicity. It's, it's our, as fallen human beings, duplicity is our default position. So we don't run screaming into the night thinking I'm a duplicitous person. Rather, what we do is we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to live in two worlds and it's just sucking the life out of me. I am so tired. I am so tired of trying to meet people's expectations. I can remember when I was a, a, a younger uh, teacher, I was struggling with this, because you're young, you're trying to get it right, you're trying to impress people, you don't want to screw this up. And before I would teach, my nerves just, just <laughs> and then after I teach, what did they think, did I get it right? Am I Henry now, am I valuable? Moving beyond duplicity restores one's energy. And now oh, I'm almost 74. I think I've started to take steps in the right direction. <laughs> so I'm not nearly as nervous as I used to be when I was 45 or 50. I have discovered, you know, like Juanita. You're just not as important as you thought you were. 
you'll probably screw up in some way. And by God's grace, you'll help somebody out. Don't get a headache over this. Just try to do the best you can. They all think you're a knucklehead anyway. <laughs> Jesus insists on seeking the first the kingdom because he longs for his followers to be straight talkers and straight livers. He wants our words and lives to fit together. He longs for our lives to ring true. That's what simplicity is about. Not perfection. Not perfection, but a life that rings true. And those around us sense that it rings true. This is the most probably important paragraph I'll read this morning. It's on the bottom of 225. Learning to live simply with Jesus then concerns our hearts fundamental orientation before it concerns itself with anything else. Simplicity provides a conceptual framework and specific practices for learning to seek the kingdom of God first. It helps us learn to seek first the kingdom. We're going to start, Jesus doesn't say, seek, seek the kingdom of God first, see you later. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, I'll show you how. And in the history of the church, down through hundreds of years, certain practices have been identified as helpful in aiding a precious image bearer to be more and more whole and not divided. Wholeness holiness. And when you, when you run into a holy person, you'll be attracted. You won't be repelled. You'll be attracted because love will be radiating out of that person. It's a good thing. Simplicity helps us to focus our attention on what really matters. So, Rochelle Parm, I'm smiling because I like, I, I actually love Rochelle. She's just a wonderful woman. Um, page um, 227. Her struggle was with comparison. Now, we all compare, don't we? Oh, I wish I was like him. I wish I was like her. You know, and God gave out gifts under the Christmas tree. I was the one person left out. She seems to be so gifted. I could never do that. You know, comparison. And comparison is, a, is, is a, not helpful. <laughs> Rochelle uh, says, comparison places us on one side of the scale and another person on the opposite side. So you're, if you put yourself on the scale with another person, either the scale's going to go up or the scale's going to go down. I, either you're going to compare yourself to another person and think, oh, I could never, or they're so much greater, or dot, dot, dot. Or the scale goes up. Well, I don't know which direction it's going. <laughs> the scale shifts and we think, thank God for me. <laughs> Where? Where would, where would the world be without me? God bless you all. It's not helpful. She says, by its very nature, comparison separates us from other people rather than connecting us to them. The goal is love, seeking the good of the other. And if we're com comparing, we disconnect ourselves to somebody rather than connect ourselves to somebody, whatever direction the scale is moving. Just when we need to feel, Rochelle writes, the embrace of other people, we set ourselves apart from or even against another. Here were her particular struggles. Not cultured enough. Not sensitive enough. 
not spiritual enough, not generous enough, not accomplished enough, not independent enough. What would you add to the list? We all have comparison struggles. Who's not long to make the A team, the varsity, and didn't get picked? Now, in, in high school, I was in high school. When I was in high school, I was in high school from '64 to '68, and it was really interesting. I was going back and thinking about what did you have to do to be accepted in high school. It was uh, interesting. I, at my high school, maroon socks. I have no idea why. <laughs> maroon socks were absolutely necessary if I was going to be in and not out. In group, out group. Black socks came in a close second. God help the poor soul who wore white socks with black shoes. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Penny loafers were in. Lace black shoes. What could you be thinking? Cuff pants, yes. No cuffs, absolutely not. Uh-oh. I distinctly remember this one. Button-down collars, a social necessity. No buttons on your collar. I can still hear the taunting voices. Oh, you're going to fly away. <laughs> I still remember that. I still remember that. But you look at each one of those characteristics, and we're all thinking, what were they thinking? Why, why did these become values? values? Human beings almost uh, innately will come up with yeses and nos to separate themselves from each other in such a, such a way, uh, normally, so a group can feel superior. And then some of us struggle with the opposite thing. So uh, I, worked for, I worked with uh, uh, college students for years, for years at Eastern University, 24 of them. And I thought about these, uh, uh, these precious souls. I would walk into the auditorium to teach this class and I would look out at them, and so many of them uh, tormented by what, what I write about, uh, who I write about in this chapter. I named him Hologram Hal. Hologram Hal. Hal wakes up each day, this is not the hologram, this is the real Hal. Hal wakes up each day anxious and fearful, but doesn't want others to know. The day ahead looks daunting to Hal, indeed overwhelming. Butterflies stretch their wings in Hal's stomach and soon begin to flutter. His nervous system is on alert. As Hal flips his legs over the edge of his bed, troubling questions and concerns reawaken and disturbing emotions reignite. Should I go to class? Will my friends be there? Why don't I study harder for that quiz? How should I dress? Behind these basic questions, deeper ones lurk. Who are my real friends? Do they really like me? Anybody, is anyone noticing me? Does anyone care that I exist? How will these questions rumbling through his psyche like distant thunder resumes a tough daily construction project? Think of yourself transformation into the person he believes other students will like. House concluded that no one could possibly be attracted to him as he really is. So each morning, Hal painstakingly creates a hologram of himself that he'll project all day. Surely this other Hal will be welcome, accepted, and perhaps even loved. The real Hal accompanies Hologram Hal all day long. Some students like Hologram Hal, a few don't. 
But Hal is convinced that no one could possibly love the real him. And so Hal projects a self he hopes others will find attractive, a hologram, and constantly adjusts its contours and colors as the day goes by. Finally, at the day's end, Hal crawls back in bed. He's exhausted and discouraged. Hal rolls over and turns off the light, and there is his companion, hologram Hal, glowing in the dark at the foot of his bed. I don't even like you, Hal sighs. How could anyone else? Finally, Hal falls asleep, yet when he awakes the next morning, flips on the switch, and hologram Hal lights up. It's going to be another long day. Not only college students, not only college students. There is, there is such freedom offered to us in simplicity, such freedom. So I have a pause and reflect section on uh, page 230 that you might take a look at. What does your personal hologram look like? What lights up in the dark staring at you at day's end? What keeps you from switching your hologram off? How might Jesus help you to do so? I think what, Je what Jesus would say is, I don't like him either. I don't like hologram, Hal. I like you. Indeed, I love you. I created you. Holograms demand a lot of energy. We wander a dream world populated by others' expectations. Wow. Think about that for a minute. A dream world occupied by other people's expectations. It's grim, frightening territory and too often a nightmare. Richard comments, Richard Foster, quote, how desperately and sincerely we labor to create the right impression. Instead of becoming good, we resort to all sorts of devices to make people think we're good. We just don't need to do that. He's offering us freedom. He's offering us freedom. And so um, I actually took my, my watch off because I can't see the clock in the back. Um, I had a <coughs> I had an interesting experience on a Christmas morning when uh, we were unwrapping uh, presents. And uh, my dad lived down in Virginia at that time, old grizzly bear. And uh, he, he sent me a present. And it looked like a watch container, a little box. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe send me a watch. And I opened it up, and it was a Rolex. And I thought, what in the world is he doing? He can't, afford, he can't afford to send me a Rolex watch. I, that's got to cost thousands of dollars. But initially, I thought, let me, let me read this. I admit that the thought of having a Rolex wrapped around my wrist was appealing. Someone might notice. Someone might say, I see you're wearing a Rolex. <laughs> Quite a watch. Yes, it is, I'd respond smugly. It was a gift from my dad. Not only would my Rolex admirers think I was special, but they'd know I came from a wealthy family. My dad must be an impressive individual. The expensive piece of jewelry on my wrist, whose sole function was to tell me the time of day, indicated clearly how special the Hall family was. We were Rolex people. <laughs> when I regained my sanity and rose out of my Rolex reverie, 
I called my dad. Our Christmas conversation went something like this. Uh, Thanks, Dad, for the watch, but it's way too expensive. I really can't keep it. I appreciate the thought, though. Oh, you can keep it, he chuckled. It's a counterfeit. (laughs) I bought it in Hong Kong for 20 bucks. Maybe you can impress someone. That thought quite evidently amused him. Dad found it funny that someone might be impressed by the cost of a watch. I think of Foster's words as I recall this conversation with my dad. Out of fear that others might discover who we are, we create an artificial world of ostentatious display, extravagant ornamentation, and pretentious style. We call upon the beautician, the tailor, and the dressmaker to create an impression of perpetual youth. We buy clothes, cars, and houses beyond our means in a frantic attempt to appear successful. That's not simplicity. What is it? Duplicity. Duplicity. Why am I so concerned about what others think of me? Do you sometimes ask yourself that question? I do. Isn't it more likely, though, that they aren't thinking of us at all? (laughs) Anthony DeMello makes me chuckle. (coughs) Quote, before I was 20, I never worried about what other people thought of me. After I was 20, I worried endlessly about all the impressions I made and how people were evaluating me. Only sometime after turning 50 did I realize that they hardly ever thought of me at all. (coughs) So Jesus offers a different way, and it's called simplicity. Simplicity is based on trust. Trust. Trust that God didn't make a mistake when he created you and me. As the people we actually are. Now, all of us, particularly group, looks like in this group, the vast majority of us have a lot of history. And sometimes that history can confuse us. And we think, looking back over the years, oh, Like, like Chaz was mentioning this morning, and I want to reemphasize it in my own particular way, God did not make a mistake in creating you. And at that point, when I say that God did not make a mistake in creating you, if you find a little voice saying, yes, he did, <laughs> that's not God's voice. That's not God's voice. It might well be a different king's voice. Oh, God loves someone like you, really. No, that's a different king's voice. And what do you do with that voice? You rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And every time we do so, we we regain another ounce of sanity, spiritual sanity, emotional sanity. And actually, sometimes uh, physical health deepens in us when we deal with these other issues more effectively. Trust that God did not make a mistake. And some of us will struggle with that maybe to the day of our death. That's okay. On the day of your death, you'll have a pleasant surprise. And you wonder, why did I waste all those years wondering about this when someone's looking at you and saying, welcome home. Welcome home. And freedom. Freedom from other people's expectations and demands. Freedom from the need to impress others. Freedom to be Im- precious image bearers God has created us to be. Freedom to be loved that God loves us without qualification. Is there a little voice saying, 
well, I know if God loves me, but he would love me more if dot, dot, dot. It's impossible for God to love you more. It's impossible. Because God's love is infinite. Infinite. It has no boundaries. It's impossible to speak a little bit uh, technically, it's impossible for God to love you. No, because on an ontic level, in the very be- being of God, the very being of God is love. God can't love you less. It doesn't work for God. God's being doesn't match up with that thought. <clears throat> Maybe you've got to chew on that for two or three years. Maybe longer. Maybe not. I, had an, uh, I want to tell you about an experience I had. I got a, a minute or two here. I had an experience where if you turn to 238, uh, my closest friend was Gary Edmonds. I always called him Munns. And uh, we were in France. We went over to France to plant a church together uh, on the border of Geneva. And I needed a car. And so I was starting to learn about simplicity. And I thought that, well, God would surely want me to buy the cheapest car available. And so uh, we were in Munza's car driving past various car dealerships when I told him to slow down. Ahead on our left was a promising place. Cars were lined up in neat rows, and there in the distance, I spotted a small, sporty-looking red car. Now, Red cars. Yes. Yes. I love red cars. I had to take a closer look. Pull in here, Munz. I, I want to like, take a look at that red car. Now, this man knew me like the back of his hand. Munz gave me a skeptical look and warned, don't be impulsive. Take your time. There's lots of cars to look at. We don't have to buy one today. I know. I know but that red one. I learned later it was a Simca. Looks great. Looks aren't everything, Munz replied. Well, I bought the car. (laughs) Because I bought the car because it was red and sporty looking. And I also bought the car because I was thinking, this is what simplicity is. Simplicity is always buying what's cheapest. (laughs) And the car was possessed. I would be driving, <laughs> this is God's truth, I would be driving the left front door, with my driver's side door would just open up. <laughs> I would, I would sense sometimes I'd drive it, and the snow drip bank ahead, the car would be tugging in that direction. And, and all the while, my pal, looking at me for the six months or so that I owned that car, like I had lost my mind. <laughs> no, that's not what simplicity is. Simplicity is wisdom. We're not buying a car because of the impression we can make on somebody else. That's not simplicity. But we're, we're buying a vehicle that can get us from point A to point B safely and efficiently. And it's fair to add a little fun in there. I've, I've, I've told my family, I want to buy a red Corvette someday. It's not going to happen. I'm beyond being able to drive a red Corvette safely. (laughs) So I wanted to I wanted to uh, share a last experience with you. Yeah, last experience. It has to do with Hagen Dazs. You like Hagen Dazs? I do. So the year was around 1972, my first year as an assistant professor. This is page 241. Uh, my first year as an assistant professor of theological and biblical studies at Eastern University. I had finally finished years of graduate studies, and by God's grace, Eastern hired me. Assistant professors don't make a lot of money at that time. They still don't, but we were happy I was finally drawing a regular salary. Deb had also been hired as a teacher's assistant what came to be our home church, Good Sam. 
So we were able to pay the rent, shop for groceries, clothe ourselves and three kids without too much strain. We weren't poor, but we weren't rich. We surely had to be careful with expenses and luxuries. So as a general rule, we didn't have dessert with dinner. The kids learned to do without. One evening though, when dinner had ended, I thought it was time for a treat. <clears throat> Suddenly I raised my voice and arms at the table and pronounced, tonight we will have hagen dogs. <laughs> Deb looked at me as though I'd lost my mind, but I insisted, tonight, hagen dogs. The kids were delighted. I'm not sure whether they knew what hagen dogs was, but the dessert sounded great. As we climbed in the car, I described to everyone the delight of haagen ice cream bars. I'm a seven on the Enneagram for those who follow the Enneagram. We're gluttons. Anyway, silent, happy expectation filled the cabin of our Mazda hatchback as we drove down to the grocery store. We arrived. I can still see this in my mind. We arrived and walked in a solemn procession to the frozen foods refrigerator. There behind the frosted glass of the ice cream case were stacked haagen dazs chocolate ice cream bars sprinkled with almonds. Mm. For a moment, we simply paused and gazed. I see, can still see the case just Then I handed everybody a bar. We made our way to the checkout aisle, each carrying our treasures reverently. I paid for the ice cream bars. Deb gulped a bit when she saw how much they cost. And we, looked, we headed out to the car. We settled down, opened the bars, and began munching. Glances and sighs of enjoyment were exchanged. They're really good, the kids murmured, and they were. Even better was the joy filling a family of image bearers on this special occasion. Moderation, that's an aspect of simplicity. Moderation, rarely did we have dessert, combined with proportion, <coughs> proportion, only one bar each, and discretion. This was the right time to have a special treat. Moderation, proportion, discretion provided a wonderful occasion for joy. So, in, oh, in light of the time, um, just pause and reflect with me, page 244. What are you tempted to pretend? In what areas? Why are you pretending? What is the impre impression you're trying to create? Why do you think this impression is important? Are there particular people in your circle of acquaintances and friends you try to impress? Just chew on that. Surround it all with the grace of God. Just chew on it. And then uh, some practical steps into simplicity that Richard mentions. Buy things for the usefulness rather than their status. Reject anything that's producing an addiction in you. Anything that's diverting or replacing your fundamental allegiance to the kingdom. Develop the habit of giving things away. De-accumulate. De-accumulate. Deb does this once a year. She'll kind of move through the house. We don't need this anymore. We don't need this anymore and so on. I'll growl a bit. Uh, but then I, when I did this... Uh, uh, maybe six months ago, a year ago, I, I looked in my closet and I just started grabbing things that I, I don't even wear that anymore. What, I just started grabbing things and suddenly I had this, <laughs> you know, all this, these clothes, I didn't need them. I just went down and put them in one, one of those yellow boxes uh, that uh, pe people who don't have as much might appreciate. Maybe think about that. Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Learn to enjoy things without owning them. 
I used to uh, sometimes think, you know, it'd be really great to have a pool. Now, at that time, we had a, a backyard the size of a, a postage stamp. <laughs> it'd really be great to have a pool. But what I discovered was for our family, our particular family, uh, we, because I was faculty, faculty at Eastern, we could use the faculty swimming pool. And it was great. And we were with all these other folks then. Our kids were running around with other kids and so on and so forth. I discovered that in our case, I didn't have to own it to enjoy it. And I'm glad to be invited to any home that has a swimming pool. <laughs> so the Lord bless you and keep you. <laughs> have a great week. Thank you.